Uh, I have uh, been the pastor of Basin Baptist Church. I had the privilege of, of having that position for the last almost 20 years. Uh, I have a picture, hopefully, that's going to come up uh, of that day when I was inducted 23rd of August 1997. Some of you might recognize some of the people on that uh, slide. Um, some of you may not, because either because they, they look so old now uh, or because they've gone on to other places. Uh, you might recognize it. Everybody ought to recognize the guy hidden, partially obscured by the microphone, uh, although he does look rather young there in comparison to what he looks like today. Uh, but we have Ken Roxburgh, who was at that time the principal of the college. Uh, myself, Alan Shanks was the deacon at the time. Jack Quinn was the interim moderator, if you know what that is. And then uh, Jim McNair, who was the church secretary. Uh, at the time all these years ago. So, uh, and the purple carpet. Uh, you know, some of you never had the privilege of seeing that purple carpet up in the old sanctuary. This is, this is uh, up in the old sanctuary, up the stairs. Uh, the purple carpet has gone. Uh, although actually some of it's hidden behind nice wood uh, panelling. Uh, but it was quite, uh, quite a sight, the, the purple carpet with the white chairs in its day. Uh, and so that was, that was the, the beginning. A couple of weeks after I started, I uh, had an evening service where I preached on this passage, on Matthew 28. I connected it as well with uh, Mark, uh, Mark chapter 12. Mark 12 is uh, the great commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then alongside the greatest commandments, we had the great commission uh, as well. I went for the whole thing that night. Uh, you're getting the shortened version <laughs> this morning. Uh, and really what I was saying that evening was that these two parts of scripture are absolutely fundamental to all that we are uh, as Christians and all that we are as a church. And what better place to go in determining what the purpose of the church is than the words that Jesus commissioned the early church with these words here in Matthew 28. Uh, and when I arrived in the church, um, having come from an accountancy background, I, I did have a look at the annual accounts for 1997. That seemed like an appropriate thing to do. I'm not sure that's what everybody would do uh, when they start a new job, is look at the accounts. But in the accounts, I don't remember what the figures said, but there was a statement which seemed to be something of a mission statement. And it was this, to glorify God in all that we do, collectively as a Christian fellowship and individually, for the corporate life of our church, for individual life, for our neighborhood, and beyond our neighborhood. There's quite a lot in there. Um, I mean, it's, it's good, you know, to glorify God. There's not much more that's better than that that we could do. Uh, but it is quite broad. It was quite broad. You know, corporate life of the church, the individual life, the neighborhood, beyond our neighborhood. That's like just everywhere. We need to do that. So it sounded great. But it was quite general. Quite a lot of words in it. Probably very difficult to remember and easily forgotten. And in fact, that was only the, ever time, only, the, the only time I ever read that statement. I never heard anybody ever... Uh, speak it out. So it wasn't really heavily used. And so it was forgotten as soon as the 1997 accounts were published. Uh, so that was the kind of uh, mission statement, I suppose, if you like, if there was one at the time I came to the church. A number of years later, in 2005, uh, Karina and I had the opportunity to visit Uganda on a sabbatical uh, trip. Uh, I went for 10 weeks, Karina came for four, because she still needed to look after the kids uh, at home. And uh, one of the things we had the privilege of doing was uh, meeting up with Kate Christie. I suspect we probably all look quite a bit younger there, including Kate. Uh, she was out with a BMS action team in Uganda and had an absolute uh, ball out there in Uganda. She was in a couple of different places. This is when she was just to the north of Kampala and we took a trip over one day by bus uh, to meet up with Kate and see how she was getting on. So that was a, a wonderful uh, privilege to do that. Uh, at one point in the trip, uh, Karina had returned home 
Uh, I was in a, a flat, just a flat sitting for one of the other missionaries uh, in towards the center of Kampala, not quite the center. And the lights had gone out. Uh, that was a fairly regular occurrence, as you probably appreciate somewhere like Uganda. Uh, they struggle to keep the lights on. Um, they do have a massive uh, electric dam, hydroelectric dam on the Nile River, but they sell a lot of their electricity to Kenya and they don't have enough for themselves. So every second night, roughly, uh, we would have a power cut and that was one of those nights. So I put some candles on, as one does, uh, when the lights are out. Uh, and then I just kind of had a read of my Bible and just spent some time with the Lord, which seemed the best thing to do. Uh, and looking out of the, um, the flats from the balcony, you could see central Kampala, where the, uh, the uh, president's palace was, was located. All the lights were on there uh, because they rarely went off. Uh, that would have upset him a little bit. Uh, and so you could see the city lit up in the background as well. But I had a real encounter with God that night. It was just a fantastic time. So maybe we should uh, get uh, power cuts more often to encourage that. And I sensed God giving um, me a new kind of mission uh, and vision for the church. And, and that was really the first thing I preached when I came back. And the mission statement that I kind of came up with at that time was this. To be a people, by the way, you don't need to remember these. Uh, <laughs> I should say, don't need to remember these. To be a people after God's own heart, who are faithful both to his word and his spirit, and thereby demonstrate passion for Christ and compassion for his world. Uh, so that was very grand. Again, you know, lots of good things uh, in there. And it, it fitted closely with the, the vision, which had four parts, which was all to do with... Uh, uh, our passion for God, uh, enjoying the power of God in our lives, taking off our masks and engaging uh, seriously in mission in our world, the two P's and the two M's. But again, that mission statement was quite general. It, there was quite a lot in it. It was really pretty hard to remember it and easily forgotten. Uh, and actually, I have to be honest, I've forgotten it as well until I went back and looked at the things I'd written about it at the time. Uh, four years later, in 2009, uh, though the vision didn't change, our two P's and two M's, uh, we decided to get a little bit uh, simpler with our mission statement. We felt it was too complicated, too difficult to remember, so we came up with something else, which is still our mission statement today. I wonder, does anybody know what it is? No. Transformed by Christ. No, to change the world. That's right. Yes. My wife knows it. Well done, Karina. And I didn't even prompt her this morning. Transformed by Christ to change the world. So it was simpler. It was theoretically easier to remember, but not everybody's remembered it. And that's probably our fault because we probably don't, didn't remind you enough about it. But yes, we do want to be transformed. We all need to be transformed by Christ and the power is there in the gospel to change us. And we have a real heart to change the world as well. But it is, as I say, a little bit general still, particularly the second part, because change the world, what does that mean? You know, it could be that we want to stop global warming or, you know, any sort of other change uh, is possible. It's not as specific, perhaps, as it could be. Uh, two years ago, we then uh, renewed our vision and values, and we started to become God-centered, growing together, and generously serving and that's still uh, these are still the values underpinning all the different things that we do in our church and I hope those are expressions that you have heard so that's a little bit of the history to our kind of mission statements and uh, vision uh, in the church which has been kind of changing and evolving and, and uh, just depending on what we felt God was saying to us at, at any given moment back in February uh, a number of us from the leadership, a small team, attended uh, an event called Lead Academy. Uh, and that was two days, the first of a, a series of eight days, four sessions over the next two years. And Lead Academy 
Uh, it's an organization down in England who were brought up by Martin Hodson of the Baptist Union. Martin came and uh, preached at our anniversary services back in January. And Martin used to be a, a pastor down in a church, Baptist church in England, and he said this was the very, very best thing that they ever did as a leadership in the church was this uh, program, Lead Academy. And so he's encouraging uh, Baptist churches up in Scotland to get involved in this. And nine churches from around Scotland came to Larbert. There's a picture of the uh, Caronvale House, which is the BB centre that we were um, visiting for that event uh, at that time. Uh, the sessions and exercises that we did over those two days were really excellent. They were challenging. They covered a, a lot of ground and it included uh, our mission or purpose once again. So it kind of pushed the team to, to revisit that whole area. And one of the exercises that we undertook at that time, which was a really helpful one, was, was really the why question. Why? Why what? Well, why is really all about our purpose? You know, what would God's answer be to that question for our church? You know, why have I put you here in Bear's Den? And so God would have an answer to that why question. And clearly that's really the most important answer to the why question. Uh, the leaders of, of a church, they might have a, a slightly different answer to the why question. Why um, are you here in this place as a church? The wider uh, church members and those who come along regularly to the church, they might have a different answer to that why question. And then the community uh, might also have a different answer again to the why question. Why is this church here? For some people in the neighborhood, it might be just it's a helpful extra car parking now that they've started charging you at the cross. It may be because of bumps and bundles. They like it because of the mother and toddlers group. That might be the why for the church being here. There may be different reasons why the community might say why we're here. As I say, clearly the most important answer is God's answer. And the ideal, in an ideal world, the other three answers should all be the same as what God sees for the church. The leadership should be connected in with that. The church should be connected in with, with that. And the community should maybe be seeing that worked out in the, the way that the church lives and operates. Now, when we were having a little discussion in the group, uh, I suggested that God's main purpose surely was to see his kingdom come in our community. Again, very grand. John Burns, our uh, youth pastor. Sorry, I'm going to call you out, John. But you may remember that uh, day. He then said, well, what does that mean? <laughs> to see his kingdom come in our community. It sounds grand, but what does it mean? And so we kind of had a bit of a, a wrestle with that question. What, is that, what does that mean? What does it mean to see God's kingdom come here in our community? And at the end of that little discussion, we kind of came out with a little phrase that said, well, it's uh, people becoming disciples of Jesus and being baptized. That's what we would really like to see happening. People from outside the community, maybe some who have never heard about Jesus, will hear about him through us. They'll come to the church and they'll get baptized because they're now disciples of Jesus have been born again. Uh, and that's the kingdom coming. And of course, those in the team immediately recognized that that kind of a statement linked right back to Matthew 28 and the Great Commission. That's what Jesus was saying there. And so that's why I was keen to, to just delve into that passage a little bit this morning as we think about a mission statement for the church. Uh, as Graham read, it begins, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Then you come to verse 17. When the disciples saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now to me, worship seemed the obvious response. You know, if we were to meet the risen Jesus, what would we do? I suspect most of us think, well, we, we would worship him uh, in our own way, you know. 
I'm not sure we'd need to sing us a worship song. We'd probably just get down on our knees before him and worship him uh, with our hearts. But some doubted. That really struck me when I was reading that passage recently. What an astonishing comment. Here were Jesus' closest disciples. They had been told to go to this mountain in, in Galilee. Um, many of them had seen Jesus die on the cross. They certainly heard uh, from people who had seen it, if they had run off and hidden. And then, in Jerusalem, Jesus had, had met with them, the risen Jesus. So they knew he had died. They knew he had been resurrected from the dead. But still, some doubted. And that gives me comfort. If I ever struggle with doubts, and I hope it gives you some comfort. When we doubt, we have not witnessed these events firsthand. We've read about them in the Word of God, but we haven't witnessed them. Perhaps like some of those disciples then, we don't know uh, who it was. They don't name them, which is probably a good thing. Perhaps like them, sometimes we too have doubts. The good thing is, their doubts did not disqualify them from being disciples or receiving the commission that Jesus was about to bring to them. And so too, our doubts don't disqualify us from being Jesus' disciples. That's good news. It's clearly better to worship Jesus than doubt Jesus. But our doubts don't disqualify us. Verse 13 goes on, and Jesus is saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Jesus, three years before, had been offered authority by the devil at his temptation. He offered him authority over all the kingdoms of this world. So it was a limited authority. It was limited to the earth only. And of course it was an illegitimate authority. The devil had stolen it from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden through his lies and their failure. Uh, and he received that authority from them. But the authority that the Father gives the Son or gave the Son was all authority. Uh, it was not just over the earth, it was over the heavens as well. And it came to him legitimately through his death upon the cross, which is where he won the victory and, and, and received this authority from his heavenly Father. And the therefore that leads us then into to the next verse is there to explain to us that Jesus has delegated that authority to us, the authority at least on the earth, to do what he has determined we should do. His plan for the church, which he then goes on to explain. And so therefore there is no reason at all why should we, we should be reticent or reluctant in any way. Because we have received the authority from the Son of the Most High God to carry out his plan and purpose for the church here on earth. Which is, verse 19, to go and make disciples of all nations. I'm going to ask you a question. I do want a response to this one. Hands up those who became Christians through the work of this church. In this church. How many became Christians in this church? Hands up. Smallish number. Less than the fingers on one hand. Unless you're just hiding your light under a bushel. Uh, a pretty small number. Not a big proportion. One of the things that we realized at uh, Lead Academy as we kind of went through further 
sessions uh, and questions was that we thought, well, and there may be different views on this, but we thought we had grown quite an attractive church. Uh, you know, attractive maybe in different ways for different people, attractive in terms of worship, in terms of our church culture, the way that we do things in church of our children's work and our youth work and our work with uh, senior citizens and all these different things and in also in the way we connect with community and open up the doors to the community to come here and, and uh, be involved in what we're doing. And we've seen some growth, modest growth in the church over the last 20 years. But what that little exercise shows is that most of it has been transfer growth. People either moving into the area and looking for a church to go to or people moving from another church to this church. But how good are we at making new disciples as Jesus commanded us? We have had <clears throat> quite a number of baptismal services over the years. Uh, a lot of them young people in the church, but others uh, as well. Some of those perhaps that uh, raised their hands earlier. <clears throat> but our last baptismal service was last January. Uh, with the eight uh, Polish people that came to us from uh, White Crook in Clyde Bank. And their story was just hugely exciting. <clears throat> but God had done that himself. Uh, these eight lovely people, dear people, had bought Bibles for themselves, started to read their Bibles, Polish Bibles, and uh, they had come to faith. They had been born again of the Spirit of God. And then as they continued to read, they, they, they thought, we need to be baptized. That's what the Bible says. That's what we need to, to do. We need to be baptized as believers. You know, where do we do that? And it just so happened they kind of searched on the internet. One of the nearest churches that came up was our church. They phoned and, uh, you know, we welcomed them with open arms. And those that were there for that service last January, it was just awesome. To see what God had done amongst those people. Well the team at Lead Academy was challenged by the thought that actually we're quite weak in terms of that first purpose that Jesus gave to the church. Go and make disciples of all nations. Maybe it's probably because we keep forgetting what that purpose is. And so really what we should be doing is Keeping the main thing, the main thing, going and making disciples of all nations. And there is no doubt that that is needed in Scotland. If any of you have looked at the, any of the results from the church census, the Scottish church census of the last year, it makes pretty grim reading on the whole. Um, I was showing a, a group of, of leaders two or three weeks ago for pictures, for maps of Scotland. Then this is not like the council elections, which makes even grimmer reading prob probably, um, of the church. I think it was in 84, 94. Uh, I forget the dates. The dates. <laughs> anyway, there's four different dates. It included 2025, so they projected forward. Uh, and it kind of started, pink was, was like the highest church attendance, then it turned to green, then yellow, and then cream. Well, back in 84, most of the country was pink and green. And most of the, green, the pink disappeared and it became kind of green and yellow. Uh, and then some cream started to appear. By the time you get to 2025, like most of Scotland is cream, which basically means the church has been creamed and we're virtually not here at all. Uh, really, really stark statistics. And it's really because I suspect that most of the church hasn't been taking that command seriously enough. Go and make disciples of all nations. Verse 19 goes on. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As I say, we've not been having as many baptisms as I was like, would like. I, I think we may be having some. I think the young people are, some of the young people are talking to John. 
uh, about being baptized, uh, maybe late summer, early autumn, and that's going to be exciting uh, to do that. Another question. How many people here have been baptized as a believer, either here or anywhere else? So that's quite a big uh, number. Not everyone, but it's quite a few. Now the reason it's not everyone is that perhaps, perhaps some people are still on the journey. Uh, perhaps you've not come to the point of uh, finding faith in Christ or being born again or maybe you're just there and you're just going to move on and say, I want to be baptized because that's what comes next. That's the natural response. It may be because we don't take that command of Jesus seriously enough. Although in a Baptist church we ought to because that's part of, of why we're called Baptist churches. Maybe it's for some it's because uh, they consider their infant baptism to be, um, to be a fulfillment of this command. Uh, I personally, and I speak as somebody who grew up in the Church of Scotland and was baptised as an infant, I personally don't believe it does. Uh, I don't know how much you know about infant baptism. It developed around about the 2nd or 3rd century, way after the New Testament, pretty much in the context of the increasing institutionalization of the church once it really took hold in the Roman Empire under Constantine. Uh, infant baptism became standard practice and it was really to embrace pretty much <laughs> the empire. You know, if everyone was baptized, in, in, in some ends, it may potentially have been partly political. Let's just baptize everyone and then everyone's part of this religion, which is now the imperial religion of Rome. Certainly in the story of Constantine, when he became a Christian, um, it was the day before some major battle. And the story goes is that he had the entire army baptized before they went into battle, whether they had any faith in Christ or not. Uh, and so part of the problem that's arisen over the years, and I've heard a, a Catholic bishop comment on this recently, uh, a man called Richard Rohr, that it introduced nominalism into the church. Because you were baptizing people, very young people, who hadn't been born again and might never be born again. Because you simply don't know what's going to happen in a person's life and where their journey of faith is going to take them, if it will take them to that place of faith. Uh, and so the, that has been an issue for the Roman Catholic Church is, is nominalism that can come in with infant baptism because it's not believers, but it can include people that are not believers yet. At the time of the Reformation in the 16th century, the reformers, people like Martin Luther and John Calvin and uh, those other guys, uh, they had the opportunity to ditch infant baptism. Uh, there were parts of the Reformation, what's called the Radical Reformation, people like the Anabaptists who did ditch infant baptism, but the mainstream reformers did not. And in fact, people like the Anabaptists, uh, Anabaptist means baptized again, because that's what uh, everyone else thought they were doing, They'd been baptized as infants and they were being baptized again. The standard practice of Catholics and Protestants was to drown them. Uh, the Anabaptists were persecuted for this kind of recovery of believers' baptism as part of faith. And so the reformers held on to it. They didn't like the theology behind it as used by the Catholic Church, and so they developed their own theology. Um, which I'm going to summarize in one line, but actually you probably really need to read about a 20-page document to really properly understand what this is all about. But it's the idea that there's a continuous covenant of grace all the way from the time of Abraham and kind of instituted with circumcision right through to the New Testament. Uh, there was this continuous covenant of grace. In the New Testament, you have baptism, which is almost like the equivalent of circumcision. 
Uh, that's a very kind of simple explanation of it, uh, which probably doesn't help you at all. But uh, if you want to go and read about it, go on the internet and the, you'll get a much longer and more complex explanation. Uh, and so instead of ditching the practice, they just changed the underlying theology to make it a little bit more biblical, but in my opinion, not fully biblical. But as I said, you're basically introducing people, very small people, uh, who are not born again and may never ever be born again, and it, it leads to nominalism. So if you are born again, here this morning, and you've not been baptized as a believer, then I would encourage you to be baptized as a believer, because that's what Jesus instructed us to do. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I've got a picture on the wall of uh, somebody doing just that. I don't know if anybody recognizes uh, the man in the pool. It's Wackas, yes, Wackas. Uh, some of you will know Wackas, some of you will met, have met Wackas. Wackas has preached here in the church. Uh, he used to come quite regularly to clan gathering. Wackas is a Christian pastor in Pakistan. Now, you would not think that uh, Pakistan was the, maybe the best place to preach the gospel or the most fruitful place to preach the gospel. But on this particular day, at this baptismal service, Wakas baptized 52 people. Uh, the people behind, most of the people in the picture behind the pool are actually the queue to be baptized. And so here in Pakistan, which we would normally think of as well, it is a predominantly Muslim country, they are taking seriously, the church is taking seriously the call to go and make disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think that's just such an exciting photograph. And one that we need to take as an example for ourselves. We go on to verse 20. Teaching them to obey everything. I have commanded you. And now that's probably what we think of as, as discipleship. And certainly teaching was a major part of Jesus' ministry when he was here on the earth. And yet I think it includes more than just you know, teaching verbally, because Jesus did so much as well without words. He delivered people from evil spirits. He performed miracles. He healed the sick. And I think there can be two dangers for us, for churches in this area of obedience. One is that we get good teaching, but we fall down uh, on the application of that teaching. We hear it, we maybe take it in, but it doesn't really move from our head to our heart, and we don't actually live it out in our lives. Uh, and that's really all about obedience. And perhaps it's because we now think, well, we're under grace, we're not under law, and so therefore obedience doesn't have to be such a big issue for us as it was, say, for the Jews in times past. But I'm sure that every single one of us knows from experience that when we are disobedient to God's word, it just makes us miserable. I'm sure if we're honest, when we are disobedient, it makes us miserable. We're just not right with him. And when we're not right with him, we're just not right. But when we are obedient, you know, we know what joy that places in us. It just brings his peace and his grace comes into our lives when we let go of all the rubbish. And so I do think that as the church, we need to be more serious about obedience. And in fact, Jesus, in certain statements, connects obedience with love. Obedience is an expression of our love for God. It could be something that is used as a measure of how much we love God, the extent to which we're obedient to his word. A second danger is that we focus on certain elements of Jesus' teaching that we're comfortable with, but we don't focus on everything. 
And parts of the church, large parts of the church, maybe have struggled over the years with uh, what you might call the signs and wonders, uh, elements of faith. Uh, And yet that was part of what Jesus taught uh, through what he did when he was here on earth. And that's what the church did through Paul and Peter and the other apostles, the other disciples in the book of Acts. And we're going to be, in fact, starting a new series on Acts uh, next week just to explore uh, what the early church looked like. There's nothing in in the scriptures to support the view uh, that these things all came to an end in 100 AD or whenever it was. Um, The sense is that actually these things are things that we should still be doing according to that principle of teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Verse 20 goes on, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What a comfort to know that Jesus is with us. And this is true in two very important ways. One of them we explored last week at the Cafe Church service. That thought, well, we asked the question, where is Jesus? And the kind of probably theologically correct answer is he's sitting at the right hand of his father in heaven. At that point, at this point, Jesus was about to disappear from the disciples' view. They'd had him appearing, the resurrected Jesus, for 40 days, and he was about to disappear, to return to heaven to be with his heavenly Father. But he was still, and still today, is only a prayer away. Because he is with us always, to the very end of the age. Uh, The other way, of course, in which Jesus is still with us, is that he sent his spirit. Ten days later at Pentecost, he sent his spirit to live within us. So in a sense, in that sense, he's here in our hearts right now because it's Jesus' spirit. The Holy Spirit is Jesus' spirit filling us, inspiring us, empowering us, emboldening us, and propelling us in our mission. So we don't have to do this on our own. I think that's what probably worried The disciples in Acts chapter 1, they were hiding away in an upper room. They were terrified. We're going to have to do this ourselves. But no, Pentecost came and they were given all the resources of heaven to fulfill the mission. So, having explored Matthew 28, we could simply take that statement of Jesus as our mission statement. But it is quite long. Some of us, who have memories that are a little bit dodgy, uh, might uh, find it hard to remember it all. And it may be that there's some particular aspect God wants to kind of focus us on for this season. Uh, And so we have, uh, as as a leadership, agreed on a new mission statement. And uh, you're amongst the first people in the church to hear it. And it is this. Being and making disciples of Jesus. Up at the top. Do you want to repeat it to me? Being and making disciples of Jesus. Now we hope it's simple. Certainly simple. Hopefully it's easy to remember. And it's very specific. And it begins partly with us being disciples and probably being better disciples of Jesus than we are because that's part of the discipleship process. And becoming better disciples is what we've been talking about this morning in terms of worshipping more, probably and doubting less, recognising and using the authority that Christ has placed in us, being actively missional, and invitational to the folks that we meet uh, in the street, down our street, being baptized if we're not already baptized, and baptizing those who come to faith in Christ, learning and obeying the teaching of Jesus, and recognizing his presence and power within us. And I think we've been poor at promoting our previous mission statements. We're planning to change that, and and please tell us if we're not uh, promoting it adequately, by repeating it. 
Being and making disciples of Jesus. Being and making disciples of Jesus. And in fact, it should get to the point where you'll be thinking, oh, not the mission statement again. Would you stop repeating that? Because it's... Yeah, being and making disciples of Jesus. Well done, Suzanne. Thank you. I've got the enthusiasm enthusiast here in the front, on the almost front row. Uh, and we've been weak at measuring uh, our success in the mission too. In fact, the mission statements we've had have been too general to measure. There may be other measures for this statement, but one is we could measure it by how many baptisms we have had. That will be a measure of whether we're making disciples. And it can be measured by the proportion of our church who have become Christians here, which hopefully might become more than 3, 4, 5 percent, as it seems to be. Today. These are things that we can measure and uh, we should be measuring them to see how well we're doing in terms of our mission and purpose, which is being and making disciples of Jesus. The most important thing is we remember it, we take it seriously and we do it. Beginning today, you can go out there and you can be a disciple of Jesus out there in the world and you can go searching for people that could become disciples because that is possible for anyone when God is involved. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these wonderful words of Jesus. What challenging words to leave with the disciples. And Lord, they're challenging words for us too. And, and maybe we look at that statement that he made and it, it, it petrifies us. But Lord, help us to remember that if we commit ourselves uh, to, to doing what Jesus says here, he will help us. He will uh, provide his Holy Spirit. We have the resources here of the Word of God. We have all the resources of heaven available to us through what Jesus has done. So there's no reason to be afraid. No reason to think that this should not be possible in 21st century Scotland and 21st century Scotland needs it and so it help us to remember this new mission statement to take it seriously and to get out there into our world and do it. Amen.